Texas Call Dialogue, Widening Your Horizons. Hey, this is Arlene, and you're listening to Duran ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. In our third segment today, we will ha- we we actually have three very um, interesting guests. Uh, they are fr- uh, directly from Macy. Uh, is an educational center, um, and we have Dr. James Kaufman, executive director of Macy, Sarah Townsend, and Hello. Benjamin. I, I, I hope I pronounce it rightly. Uh, they are ETA Program Coordinator at Macy. Welcome to the studio. Oh, thank you. Hi, thank you. Hi, thanks for having us. Yeah, so first of all, like, what is Macy exactly and what kind of activities or program do you usually do? Okay, Macy is the, is the acronym for the Malaysian American Commission on Educational Exchange. We are um, a binational association organization created by the Malaysian and American governments and we are in charge of all educational official educational exchange between the United States and Malaysia so we bring Americans like our two guests here Ben and Sarah to the to Malaysia for they can be for teaching or research and we also send Malaysians to the United States for research for degrees etc so we and we also provide information for the Malaysian public on how to study in the United States so uh, this particular discussion will be focusing more on uh, ETA, the yes. ETA program. But what exactly is that okay, the the ETA, acronym ETA? The ETA program is one of our programs. It's now our biggest. It's, it stands for English Teaching Assistant Program. And it's under the, the umbrella of what we call the Fulbright Grant Program. It's In a way, it's similar to, say, the roads in, in the UK. And so every year we bring in a number of these Fulbright ETAs, English Teaching Assistants, to work in the public schools around Malaysia. The program began very small in the state of Terengganu, just an agreement between Macy and the Menteri Besar in, in uh, Terengganu. What year was that? Hmm? What year was that? The one that was in the Chungganu? first year was 2005, 2006. Oh, quite some time so ago. So it went for, if I'm not mistaken, seven years as a state program, Terengganu, it was noticed by the uh, ministry as being a very effective program. So they said, well, maybe we can make this a, a, a larger program. And then when our President Obama met with Prime Minister Najib in Bali, I believe, in 2010, they decided that they would expand the program and make it a nationwide program with a l- much larger number of ETAs coming in. Mm. So you guys were <coughs> former alumni. Uh, should I call you Ben and S- Sarah? Yes, yeah, Ken. Perfect, thanks. So which year you guys were, I mean, selected to be part of the ETA? So I just finished up uh, my oh, you teaching just finished. a few weeks ago. Yeah, oh. um, I was placed in Pahang in SMK Dong, which is uh, right outside of Raub. And uh, I just finished up teaching. I came in and my grant ended November 1st. And then uh, I just made the transition to working with Macy. So I uh, am fresh out of the classroom. I really was working with the students only a couple weeks ago. And uh, I miss seeing them every day. It's a little bit different in the office. But mm. uh, so it was my, I'm finishing up my first year here in Malaysia. Oh. And I what also, yeah, I also just finished up teaching not too long ago. Um, what year was that? This year? This year, oh, this year yeah, well. this year. However, we have a, a new thing in the program. Uh, we're called SEDAs, uh, Senior ETAs. Uh, SEDAs come back for a second year, so I've been in Malaysia since January of 2013, and I spent two years at my school, which was really wonderful. I got to know the students really well, the teachers really well. Um, I'm also missing them a lot. I was at a school called SK Tanjong Gading. Where exactly it is? That's in Johor, ah. in a town called Moar, uh, which is about 45 minutes south of Malacca. It's, it's pretty big, about an hour north of uh, BP. Yes. Mm. So when you first started the ETA, what was the goal to be something like this, or this is never part of like the, the original plan? It's well, I'll, I'll, first of all, I was not in Malaysia when it started. I, I came in uh, two years later. But mm-hmm. when it began, it was f- first conceived as simply a way to uh, help the, uh, the school children in, Malay- in Trenganu, in particular, uh, improve their speaking of English. And so that's the way it began, very, I guess on a very small scale with limited ambitions. And then as it's grown, especially now in the last uh, two years to a federal program, we see that the goal is more than just to increase the speaking ability. 
uh, the, the Americans and the American government in particular sees this as, a, as a, a, one of the best ways of having a citizen contact between the Malaysians and the Americans in order to, to promote better understanding and uh, better ties between Malaysia and the United States. Now, if we can do this through teaching English, that's good. But the, the, really the focus is on just better understanding between our two uh, nations. So talking about understanding, maybe not <laughs> <laughs> between nations, but between uh, on the grassroots mm-hmm. among the mm-hmm. students and the American uh, ETAs. How, when you first like step into the schools, uh, do they? Uh, did you ask them like, do they do they know what is the U.S. or who are the Americans <laughs> and what is American culture all about? <laughs> do you ever ask them? Yeah, I would say uh, for a lot of ETAs, um, there are misconceptions about the U.S. Uh, a lot of our students, when we first go to the schools, can't tell us where the U.S. is on a map, so we do a lot of geography lessons. Really? They can't tell the U.S. on a map? Yeah, I think it probably varies depending on what school you're at. I don't know, Ben, was it like that for you at your school? Uh, it depends. I mean, sometimes, you know, they would confuse a lot the U.K. and the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, or Australia. Yeah, yeah, so. You don't have the queen. Yeah. <laughs> no queen. <laughs> no queen. <laughs> but but they, they, a lot of them knew President Obama. When I mentioned President He's Obama... He's actually quite popular, He's interestingly. He's very popular, yeah. So mm-hmm. most of my yeah. students... Um, they, they knew President Obama, so that was helpful, a good segue to start uh, helping them understand where exactly I came from. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they know a lot of like the big pop culture figures as well. Um, of probably course, the first thing we say, they would say, oh, American culture equates to probably McDonald's. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, yeah. In terms of food, we get asked a lot of questions about whether we like McDonald's or KFC, uh, you know, chicken chop spaghetti, sort of like. But standard. but what what kind of cultural exchange experiences that happen when uh, I mean probably the first few months uh, were there any like particular areas that you were like trying to ask you about your life in terms of how American people live their life? Were, were there any of such questions? Yeah, there were a lot of questions. I mean, some of them came early and some of them came a bit later on Mm -hmm. because as the students became more comfortable speaking with us as uh, this new person inside the school, they would become a bit more comfortable asking us bigger questions or things that they might have been wondering. So I got a lot of questions um, initially just about my area in the United States. They had never met someone from the Chicagoland area before, so they were really curious, especially about the cold. The cold weather was something that intrigued them a lot, so I I had a lot of explaining to do about (laughs) that, and uh, that whole concept was uh, was a starting point in terms of... When you say cold, meaning snow? Yeah, snow, Mm -hmm. cold weather, all the things like that. So, But there were tons of questions that came over the year. Yeah, absolutely. Students students are, are very curious about where we're from, and um, I got a lot of questions about family. People wanted to see pictures of my family and, you know, ask questions about my family structure and um, my mom and my sister. Um, and then I also got a lot of questions about food. Mm. So that was really great. And in terms of, like, teaching moments, um, you know, some of the cultural exchange happens in the classroom, Um, Some of us do really structured cultural exchange lessons. Uh, There's an example of an ETA uh, down in Johor this last year um, whose students told me about a lesson he did on Martin Luther King uh, Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, which was really popular. So we do stuff like that in the classroom. But I think a lot of the really valuable cultural exchange happens sort of in a day-to-day kind of way uh, in those small moments. And, and there's constantly these catalysts for these conversations are happening all the time. Uh, you know, students are curious about specific things like weather uh, and family and food. But then also, like, we're just obviously very different in a lot of ways. And, and so sometimes the habits we have, the things we eat, the way that we eat, the way that we carry ourselves and speak, uh, those can catalyze those sort of everyday uh, smaller cultural conversations. And, and that's happening all the time. So do they ask you to or do you go to, do you go to the schools oh, yes, and talk I've to the to, kids? Uh, well, I've been to many, most of the schools, but when I go talk to the kids, usually they're afraid and they run away. <laughs> <laughs> and one time I went to visit a school and they, they introduced me and I could see the kids were very worried. And then later the teacher told me, oh, they were very worried because they thought that you were the ETA. And then we <laughs> told them no and they said, oh, that's good. So, 
But yeah, the, actually, the you know children, some of the especially the pri- the primary school children, but even the uh, secondary can often be afraid at first. Some of it simply because they're embarrassed about speaking English, they're uncomfortable, they don't they don't have confidence. But that disappears mm-hmm. after a while. Pretty so quickly. Thank goodness you have them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. If it were me, then they would all flee. <laughs> a lot of the chances for them to kind of build their confidence in English come outside of the classroom, mm-hmm. eating lunch in casual settings or hanging so out with you, them you, at the you, hostels. You are encouraged to spend more time outside of the classroom with the kids. Oh, do yes, you? absolutely. Definitely, yeah. I'd say for some of the ETAs, probably more of the time is spent outside of the classroom doing activities, sports, uh, coaching sports and clubs and camps and various activities like that. And that's one of the things that is really valuable about the program uh, is that we really are encouraged to have these personal connections with the students. And we do spend a lot of time, not just in the structured activities, the clubs and the cocos, but like Ben was saying, uh, you know, at the hostel, at restaurants, at students' homes. uh, And that, that personal touch not only encourages students to speak English and develops like organic interest in the language and in communicating, uh, but it also, I mean, it does wonders for their performance in, in other areas of the school mm-hmm. as well. Just having an educational figure who's really invested in, in their lives beyond the, beyond the school. Yeah. So let, let's talk about the American graduates that are part of these um, ETA programs. Like, how do you choose them? How do you, how do you ensure that they are like diverse Ameri- uh, population of Americans okay. being part of this? Now, this is a worldwide program. This ETA program exists actually now in 67 countries. Uh, Malaysia is, if I'm not mistaken, now the fourth biggest in the world, uh, third biggest or second biggest in Asia. Uh, you so mean there's a, a, the a, tiny Malaysia is the tiny Malaysia is the tiger the here uh, throughout the world, but there's so there's a worldwide standard process to, to select people. So every year there's a, a, a recruitment and an application process for thousands of, of young graduates around the uh, around the country, and then there's an initial selection process usually at the university level. Then it goes to another selection process in by our uh, association in New York. Then the finalists, uh, there's a list of finalists that arrives in Malaysia, and we then choose the the, uh, ultimate list of who's going to come. So it is a very competitive process, and I think we had last year about 350 applications that arrived to our office, which meant there probably was more than that originally, out of which we chose about 90 to come. Mm -hmm. So American uh, graduates, they are definitely very curious about countries outside oh, yeah. of their territory. Oh, yeah, definitely, territory. yes. I mean, um, more and more American students want an, an international experience, so there's a, a real hunger for that, and this is looked at as one of the best ways of getting that experience. And uh, we find that more and more, what we look at, too, when we want to recruit students uh, or graduates into this program is are not only that they've been good students, that's they all have, but we want to see people who have an interest and maybe have shown that they've gone abroad and done things or worked with communities or done something that other than simply be good students. Mm-hmm. Do, do you guys got to pick and choose? Like, I want Malaysia. I was like, Malaysia is your country. <laughs> Take it or leave it. Yeah, so actually during the selection process, you're only allowed to choose one country. Really? Yeah, so you have to, you know, do some research beforehand and make some decisions and... Uh, Pick one, and then you just have to hope because uh, it, it really is uh, a, a lot is left up to the decisions of the various individuals who are making uh, the committees who make the the choices. So, so why Malaysia? What's so unique about this country? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, my long answer is probably too long for this segment, but I can just say in sort of a succinct way that after I did all of my research on the different options that Malaysia just stood out to me as a really interesting place. Interesting history, interesting in terms of culture and food and uh, yeah, I was really excited so before to, you, to come here. You, you, before Malaysia, have you been to any other Southeast Asian country? Or Asian country? I, I had never been uh, to Asia at all, so this was my uh, first chance to travel here. So I kind of narrowed things down by region, and then after that, when I was going through my initial application process, I kind of looked at each of the countries and uh, made the decision based on some great merits that Malaysia has, some awesome things that it has to offer. And for me, uh, I'm sort of, I'm one of the unique ones in the program in that I had never been out of the U.S. 
before I came to Malaysia. Really? <laughs> mm-hmm. So I decided to dive right into the, the study abroad and going abroad and working abroad experience. So Malaysia does not represent the world. <laughs> <Just> to, like, <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we will take a short break when we return. More discussion on, on the ETAs. ASEAN Breakfast Call Dialogue Widening Your Horizons Hey, you are with Arlene and we are together with Sarah, Ben and of course uh, James Kaufman from all of them from Maisie and today we are, we are going to talk about the cross-cultural exchange especially with the ETA program. Um, off air, we were discussing about you know what kind of activities you guys actually have with the kids. And as we, as we all know, Malaysian kids they are very shy. They they almost don't talk at all when it comes to and the the, the relationship between the teachers and the students usually is a one way street. You, you you give the lesson, they they listen, and that's it. There's no question and answer. So when you guys come in, you you are bringing in you, you brought in different format of teaching. And of course, you focus on English. But what was the experience, you know, the whole thing? Ben, you want to talk about it? Yeah, sure. So um, I was very fortunate at my school to have an extremely strong English panel who used a lot of creative lessons um, already in the way that they taught English. So inside the classroom, I would work with the teachers and they would help me along with some activities that encourage the students to improve their speaking skills, encourage them to try out, even if they're going to make an error, that uh, I always made them say, it's okay to make mistakes. and so It's, it's not part of the Asian culture yeah. to actually make mistakes. <laughs> like We have to either score A or nothing. Yeah, well, the, well, Americans are good, very good at making mistakes. <laughs> 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 but uh, one of the most popular programs that uh, ETAs are able to host at their schools are something we like to call English camp. An English camp it takes a lot of different forms depending on the ETA and depending on the school and the needs. But it's really this opportunity to have this integrative um, extracurricular event that happens outside of school hours, oftentimes one or two days over a weekend, sometimes more. And it gives them, uh, the students that is, a chance to really apply English in a really fun setting. We find that um, yeah, I mean, English camps. In English can be really boring in the classroom. Yeah, you know? it can be. But we we come up with themes like space camp, mystery English camp, cowboy camp, American summer camp, and they have these big themes that kind of uh, get the students pulled in to the event. And then after that, it seems like they get a bit more excited about English. They might give a bit more How effort in the classroom. How would cowboy camps be like? <laughs> <laughs> cowboy camp was actually a camp. Uh, that was hosted by uh, my housemate. And, uh, you know, it was just a bunch of really cool activities, everything from teaching them football to teaching them, you know, different dances to doing word searches and all types of races and activities that had to do more with vocabulary and learning new words. So it's a day-long process. And just in that day-long process, they also get a chance to meet other ETAs. Mm -hmm. The different ETAs will travel to these camps, so we spend most of our weekends uh, hosting English camps and meeting students from different schools, and it's just so much excitement about the English language and so much excitement about learning that really has a chance to carry over into the classroom environment, and mm -hmm. we so, think they're quite successful. So outside of the classroom, are Malaysian students really that shy? Or they are actually you know, having this dual personality? <laughs> Um, Depends on, you know, I mean, I think that's part of our job, right? As the, Part of our job as an ETA is to help students overcome their malu. Uh, <laughs> their malu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in terms of camps, yeah, we have a lot of really fun themes. Um, some of the ETAs also do like social impact camps. Uh, I did a, a girls in, in STEM camp, which was really fun. Um yeah, people address like social issues and things. And then, you know, we also do really crazy things. They learn English by like putting pie in ETA's faces. Really? I had a I had a camp I recently. To, I want to join that. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was I told you know, the students they had a moment where they were just completely shocked 
uh, I told them that if they answered the question that I was posing to them correctly, that they could put a pie in my face. And they did. And, 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 uh, then it was, it was insane. There was a lot of antics. But, um, yeah, I mean, when else are they going to get a chance to do something like yeah, that with, on the, a, on the with a teacher? Yeah, shy. It's true. Uh, I remember very well a few years ago visiting a school in Tranganu, an Agama school. And, of course, I walk onto this campus and immediately it dis- everyone disappears. I think they did, you felt they had evacuated the school. Everybody's so afraid. I went back to that school. Of course, I had an ETA in that school. I came back to that school about eight months later, toward the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I walked onto the campus, all of the kids ran out, and they were all surrounding me and, and <laughs> chattering away. Not only were they no longer afraid of me, they, were, they weren't uh, afraid at all just speaking to me in English, just uh, rapid fire. And I think, really, that was all attributed to the fact that this American ETA had been there and had broken down this barrier of shyness. And I could see it with my eye. I've seen this many times in schools around mm-hmm. Malaysia. And, um, you know, having been at my school for two years, I've seen a lot of a lot of growth amongst my students. Um, I had one student named Razin who uh, is in the lower stream standard four class uh, mm-hmm. at his school. So in, in those schools, they actually divide the, divided the class in different streams? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, he was in four chair deek, which is the lower stream. And I should also mention that I was in primary school, uh, which is something that is being phased out of the program. Um, but I was there for two years. It was a really great experience. Uh, and this student... Um, I remember entering English class, and and I, this student was off of my radar, honestly, for quite a while because he wasn't very, uh, you know, I was aware of him as a student. I was aware of all of my students, uh, but we didn't have a personal relationship at the beginning because he didn't, he wasn't uh, very active in the class. So a lot of my focus was on getting uh, the inactive students invested and involved in English. Um, And this year, uh, you know, sort of fast forward, I mean, I remember him coming to my first English camp, and from there there's been a lot of growth. Uh, This year, on my one of my last days at the school, um, we had our our closing ceremony at the school level, which is similar to what they do for teachers who are retiring. Um, And I also organized a talent show to do on this day. It's something the students had done the year previously and they had been asking for, so we made sure to to get it in there before the year was up. And uh, Razin keeps coming up to me and asking me when his turn is to go on the stage. And, you know, I've told him multiple times he knows, but he's just so excited that he, like, he, he keeps forgetting and he's so eager and ready to go on the stage. And, and, you know, he gets up on the stage and he has his hair slicked back and he's walking with a little bit of swagger and he goes up to the mic and the music starts and he belts out this rendition of All of Me by John Legend, which is very popular on the radio right now. And I turn around I and I... love the song. It's a great song. It's a great song. Um, and I turn around and I look and, and the teachers who are sitting in the back of the, the hall are a number of them have this like shocked look on their face. And halfway through the song, the head of the English panel comes up to me and says, like, does does he does Razin speak English with you? Uh, <laughs> and he does. And he speaks only English with me. Uh, and he translates for his friends and he encourages his friends to speak English. Um, and, you know, up there on the stage, he didn't miss a beat. He didn't miss a word, uh, even words that were a little bit harder for him. Uh, I, I can't remember the lyrics right now off the top of my head, but um, it was an, it was a really amazing moment, and I, I I started crying because I was just so proud of him and and all of the, you know, the progress that he's made. And and I think our ETA experiences are peppered with stories like this, of students, you know, lots and lots of individual students who we see just grow so immensely and. and not just in English, but in, in self-confidence and uh, a lot of other things as well. Mm-hmm. But why Malaysian students? I mean, throughout your time with the students, why why they are shy? Like, why what happened with them in the past that make them realize that um, I'm not good enough to speak out and and express my view? You know, I don't I don't know if there's really one thing that you could put your finger on to say. Um, I would say that I I had a pretty good mix of students who were fairly outgoing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was the third ETA in my school, so they became a bit more accustomed due to the work of the past ETAs Mm -hmm. to being outgoing. So I think I might have been quite fortunate in coming into a school where they were really willing to share and be out there. I think that for 
for a short period of time, I struggled with uh, students not realizing that I really wanted to spend every moment I could with them. <laughs> they thought for a little bit that, oh, you know, he has other things to do. He won't want to come and, you know, hang out with us at the hostel or just come and eat lunch with us or, you know, he doesn't want to sit with us. And so I think as they realized that, you know, as much as we're here to share a bit of America, we're also here to learn a lot about Malaysia. And that means trying the foods, going over to their homes, celebrating the holidays with our students and uh, learning when it's not English camp, a little bit of the language <laughs> when it's not English class, too. Um, once they realized that, that our time really was to be with them and to get to know them and have these personal relationships with them, they weren't worried about the shyness anymore. They were just worried about who got to say hi or who got to wave first when they saw us walking across campus. So you guys are posted in quite remote a areas outside of the urban uh, hotspots. What kind of um, Malaysian cultural experiences that uh, were significant to you? Mm -hmm. Do you want to share? Uh, I don't think there are too many. <laughs> if you can see weddings. Yeah, a, lot a lot of weddings. A lot of weddings. Weddings uh, are amazing. It was yeah. it was quite a cool So did you get proposals as well? <laughs> <laughs> you I, I didn't. I didn't get any proposals. So, uh, But yeah, weddings were really exciting for me. Um, all of the different holidays that happened throughout the year were really intriguing for me to have a bit of exposure to, especially with that personal connection. When I would have a teacher who would take me with their family or when I'd be able to go visit mm -hmm. my student's house or when a student would be able to explain or I would accompany my uh, my housemate who was also a teacher to see his students. It would just be fantastic to have that exposure. Yeah, uh, you know, I'll echo some of the sentiments. Uh, where I was living, I was living in Moir, uh, in the town, which is, is it's a semi-urban space. It's pretty well developed. Uh, and I was working out in a kampong, and I got to interact with a lot of different uh, populations uh, with, with different, you know, cultural and religious traditions. So that was really interesting for me. Um, you know, in the town, uh, I got to experience different festivals, uh, particularly Buddhist festivals that were really interesting. And then um, out in the Kompong, you know, in addition to going to a lot of weddings and things and people's houses what, and food. What Buddhist festival, by the way? Uh, the most recent one was the, I think, Nine Emperor Gods Festival, which oh. was really interesting. Um, and then, you know, I witnessed like a, a korban ceremony, which I had never seen anything like that before. So, uh, yeah, just just a lot of a lot of really great, really, really interesting hands-on kinds of experiences. And I would say that a lot of the other great experiences just happen in the community with people that yes. we might not know. You might just be sitting out having dinner and someone will come up and tell you a story of maybe a, a popular program that was here a few years back. Uh, was I believe it was a Peace Corps program. Mm -hmm. And we'd hear stories about other Americans who had been in the community. Or we'd hear stories and you know meet people who studied in Michigan. And then we'd have awesome conversations with them. People were just very friendly, very open to having conversations and to sharing a bit of their life with all the ETAs. And that's what makes the difference because we are quite far away from our communities that we knew before and our families most of the mm -hmm. time. They aren't uh, in the region or nearby. So this Sometimes is like your second are. family. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah. Do, do you have any Malaysian experience to share? <laughs> oh, I, I've got a number of Malaysian experiences. I don't know. I couldn't choose particularly one now. But I do want to mention the fact what they were just talking about is the purpose of the ETA program is it's a, is, is to be a reciprocal program. It's not mm -hmm. part of it is to benefit the students, help them to speak English better, to learn more about American culture, society, uh, to gain confidence. But the other half is for the Americans, ETAs, also to benefit from the experience. And I think the examples they've just given are, are good examples of how much they've learned about this society and the people, the affection they've developed for it. They take this back to the U.S. And I, as a director, I see groups of them come in, in usually every January, and they spend a year and they leave. And I can see myself during that year the change that they go through as well because they it is a growth experience in addition to learning a more about a new culture. They learn a lot more about themselves, too. They, they do a lot mm -hmm. of self-discovery, uh, simply 
by the by the experience of being away from the United States in a different community. So they also just come out as as enriched from the experiences of the kids that they're teaching. Because of the situation in global politics, uh, the image of the U.S. Uh, within ma- Muslim majority countries has not been that well. But do you think uh, the ETA program has somehow um, uh, break the stereotypes people have with American people or American culture? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is, of course, uh, a people-to-people program. This is These are not government officials we're bringing in to talk about po- policies, etc. These are simply normal people. Americans coming in and meeting normal Malaysians. And at that level, uh, that's where the stereotypes get mm-hmm. broken down very quickly. And there can be problems way up high, and you know, as I say, in politics or that type of thing. But the really important relationship is people to people. And they, these ETAs do an excellent job at just coming across as normal Americans and showing the, the Malaysians that the, the Americans are not necessarily like all these stereotypes. In particular, the ones you see on television in the movies. That's, Hollywood is that a is bad actually, thing. Uh, my guess. opinion is that's done <laughs> damage. The stereotypes of American that's culture. Done damage to their reputation because <laughs> that it does not bear much of a re- relationship with truth. I mean, these things you see. <laughs> we Americans are as shocked by some of these things we see as the Malaysians <laughs> are. That is not, uh, you know, all all people in America are not like these Hollywood images. Most people in America are very boring, like Ben and Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> I like Dr. Coffee. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to ask you um, about. The parents and the community, like, um, do do they do they um, receive you guys well, uh, or do they uh, have this skeptical like, oh, Americans? I'm sorry, I'm not going to be close with Americans. Do they have that kind of attitude? Um, in my experience, people are generally very warm and welcoming, uh, and I've had some really fantastic experiences with parents this year. I did a lot of family outreach with my programs, which was really great. Um, and I think, again, it goes back to like the, the people-to-people thing. Uh, people see us as, as regular, everyday people who are engageable, and um, I personally had a really positive experience. I would say that people uh, here in Malaysia that I've encountered have been so welcoming and so giving, so willing to share, whether it's food, whether it's uh, some idea or some story that they have from the past or or ask us a question. They're very receptive, very, very understanding um, of, you know, the fact that we're here to learn too. And I think that's what changes things. The fact that they know that we're not just here to show up in the classroom and you know work for that period of time. We're really here to make those relationships, and that makes all the difference, I think. But what are the challenges, you know, to, to of uh, as you, I mean, as the executive director of uh, Macy, and also to br- to to bring this ETA program, you know, to up to the masses. What what were the challenges that you faced? Well, I mean, the the challenges for us as the administrators of the program are the more just the logistical types of things, bringing in a hundred, for example, young people and you know, bringing them all into KL and doing an orientation and then arranging for their housing and, and their orientation in the States. All of that can, it takes a lot of work. I mean, it's it's just moving a lot of people <coughs> like that. And then once they're out in their various uh, placements around the country, we have to keep in close contact with them to make sure that things are going well or they may have a problem with this or that. Uh, we do work in cooperation with the local schools as well and the JPN, the PPDs in their region. But so the Malaysian Education Ministry are actually very much oh yeah, welcome. No, they they are our partners in this program. We mm-hmm. partner with the Ministry of Education, and then at the state levels, the JPN people work very closely with us. So that cooperation involves a lot of uh, meeting and understanding each other and working together. So it's more, I would say, just the more uninteresting logistical things that, that are the challenges. We don't usually have problems with the uh, with the ETAs themselves as far as their job, their work. No. What about you guys? Do you have any challenges, you know, throughout your time with the kids, with the community? Um, I we're really fortunate to have mentor teachers at our school. Who oh, are you kind do? Of, yeah, they're they're the on the ground person who. So they are the local teachers that yeah. help you guys to navigate yeah. your way. Yeah, exactly. My mentor teacher was the head of our English English language panel, and uh, you know. 
she just took care of everything. I mean, if anything went wrong, she would help me make sure that, you know, I was healthy, make sure that I knew how to get groceries. I didn't have a car. She helped me find a car. Really? You know, it, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I call her Katzai because she is my older sister who took care of me when I came to this country and knew no one. I didn't know the other Americans either. And oh, she so really you cared guys are not me. posted at the same place. I mean, let's say there's this one school only one ETA will be posted in that one school. Only yeah. one per school, and then we like, if, when at all possible, to have two of the ETAs living together, mm-hmm. but working at different schools. Mm-hmm. So I, w- I was in living in Rao, but I drove maybe 20, 25, or 30 minutes outside to a different school. Well, my housemate, he just walked down the hill to his school. <laughs> so I, w- I was a bit farther out, but... Um, yeah, the support systems were really important, but in terms of the challenges, I mean, adjusting to the, cl- to the classroom environment at first was a bit difficult, but, you know, with the help of the teachers, with the support of my school, I was very fortunate to have just this awesome community that was behind me. You know, in anything, I, I wanted to have a bonfire for my students so they could roast marshmallows and know what s'mores were and have graham crackers and everything like that. And We have no idea yeah. why s'mores. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my and principal uh, had lights run down to the area where I was doing it. He, he had, you know, everything lit up and things I wouldn't even know. My community would just support me. Um, so there, there weren't so many um, difficult challenges. The biggest one, of course, being uh, being away from family and friends at home, which, you know, becomes a bit difficult, but with Skype and things like that, if you put a lot of effort in, that one can be overcome as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think there are a lot of different kinds of challenges that we face out in our placements, and uh, you know, it is true that we have we have some support systems in place and uh, the folks in the Macy office also do a really good job of supporting the ETAs and taking care of them. But some of the challenges we sort of just have to figure out on our own. So for instance, you know, we're new to the culture, we're new to the communities. We make cultural mistakes a lot in the beginning, especially, and embarrass ourselves and uh, say things wrong in Bahasa, um, Malaysia, and, um, you know, we make those mistakes a lot, but but that's also how we learn. It's how we learn about the culture and learn about the communities, and uh, so even though that's challenging, it's it's a part of the, the thrill of the experience. So ETA program is expanding next year. Well, yeah, we're expanding in the number of states, but we're keeping the number at 100 per year. So we this year we have we were operating in six states, um, and the next year we will be in eight states. That would be Perlis, Kedah, Perak, Pahang, Trenganu, Sabah, Sarawak. What am I forgetting? Kelantan. Kelantan, yes. So Sabah, Sarawak, I think a lot <clears throat> of people will be looking forward to that. Oh, yeah, that, that's a popular <laughs> one. We, we had... Uh, 20 out there this year. We'll have 30 next year. So will you like so, take a vote or like, okay, well, you guys are going to Well, they don't stay. have a choice. No, <laughs> they don't have a choice. We you assign make the them. decision. <laughs> yeah, we make the decision. We, uh, and those who have been out in Borneo have, have had a very good time, but a very different one because culturally mm-hmm. it's different. And so when we get them together at meetings, all of them together, they share a lot of different, very different types of experiences too. So, so we will have another interview with those who are posting <laughs> some trauma. So any last messages before we end this show? Well, I just, you know, I just actually want to say one thing off of that last point is that, uh, you know, we take, we we are very careful and considered in where we place people. We put a lot of thought into it. And uh, I've been going through, you know, some of the preferences for this next year's cohort. And I will just say that quite a few people are interested in the peninsula. So Saba and Sarawak are interesting to folks, but, you know, people are, are also interested in Terengganu and, and uh, Perlis and things like that, too. I'd like to just say, too, the program is now has been renewed for the next three years. So it's supposed to go through 2015, 16, and 17. And I'm confident that it will be extended beyond that once uh, we, we get to that point. Do you have any yeah, last message? Definitely. As ETAs, I think that um, we just feel fortunate to have the opportunity to be spending some time in Malaysia, to be welcomed here, and also appreciative of Macy, of all the cooperation that goes between the Malaysian government and the American government making the program happen. And it's uh, 
it's an opportunity of a lifetime. It really mm-hmm. is to be able to live here, immerse yourself in a new culture, um, pick up a bit of a new language. And it, it's been an awesome year for me. And mm-hmm. I'll be staying on to help out a little bit more. And I'll be going on to my third year. So I think we both really love this country. Definitely. So all the best. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.